late 60s, early 70s, and uh, I think under 19 football was strong. Um, and a lot of players went through from Broadmeadows, Faulkner, Oak Park, Harmsy, and so on uh, to play AFL football mm. at Carlton or North Melbourne. So when you say Carlton or North Melbourne, as Bobby was that the zone? zone? That, that was the zone? zone, yeah. But sort of Bruce Dool, it had to be 20 metres over the road. Camp Brody would have been a North Melbourne player. Oh. And Harmsy as well. Oh, 20 so, metres short. Oh, gee, we can't yeah. imagine Bruce Dool running around at North Melbourne, can we, Bobby? <laughs> I'd have Bruce Dool no matter where. <laughs> did, did Bobby have a crack at you, Curl, at all? Uh, no, we weren't allowed though. to do that. No. You were allowed to do it. Bobby was way Bob. above that, so yeah, he wouldn't yeah, have done yeah, that. That's right. Very ethical man, Bobby. <laughs> but St Dominic's now, that? was that a great football... Nursery school? Nursery school. Or uh, what was it? Well, it was a, obviously a Catholic school, but yeah. I, I played there because my mates played there. I wasn't Catholic, but we used to play down in the valley uh, over oh. in West Broadmeadows, and it was just a, a football team, local football team. You were Protestant through was the week and a Catholic in the football days. Well, we got through. I don't think we told them. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, it wouldn't be allowable, would it? Well, the Pope would probably be after me now, so <laughs> be what I was saying. Might be a lightning bolt or something coming up, don't we? <laughs> it must have been uh, a big thrill for a young man from Broadmeadows to go down to Carlton in 1972, and there's the great John Nichols as captain and coach. Oh yeah, like I said, I was lucky I played third in 1970 and second in 71, and the rest was there in 71, then John Nichols. So mm. for me, it was pretty, uh, well, you're overawed because they're the blokes mm. you, you saw, you, you know, like I followed Dewey through and saw him play and used to go and watch a bit of Carlton games. I was, I was originally a South Melbourne supporter, but because your mates played there, and uh, to go down and be part of it, you know, Tony and Doug would be the same. Mm. It's it is a bit you know, um, mind-numbing. You're, you're sort of going, well, geez, am I really here? And uh, mm. you do sort of uh, take a while to acclimatise, but I think once you establish yourself and uh, you, know, you, you do the right thing, you train hard, you get a few games and you feel part of the furniture, but it's not, it's not instantaneous. It takes a f you know, few, few years to get in, in that situation, I think. Curly, you reckon now, and no disrespect, but I think you've got uh, probably a worse kicking uh, style than what <laughs> I ever had on the football field, but kicked it a lot further than me. <laughs> yeah. But uh, do you reckon with your kicking style that... In the old days, you got picked up because of a good defender, I would think. That's what they saw in you first. Do you reckon that modern day people would look at it and say, oh, that's a major issue now if we were going to pick up Curly Austin in today's footy? Yeah, it's funny because um, the great Jack Rowder was a Carlton chairman of selectors. Yeah. He um, said to me after about two years, he said, we used to worry about your kicking style, but um, after all, we worked it actually got there. It's your and, technique, and you yeah. Talking, but the technical wasn't right, so I think you're probably right. They did yeah. try and change it. Uh, they spent oh, a bit really? of time, but... I just couldn't, I was just ingrained uh, you know, yeah. in that style of play, it was unusual and, and I figured if Carl Dutch said it, I might as well do it too and get away with it. So. Yeah. Well we just might see the kicking style here. So I did play full back. Yes, yeah, it's a sort of a reverse drop punt. A reverse drop punt. It was awesome. Yeah. But uh, like you, you just said, you worked to your abilities, you found out yeah. how far or what you could do with your kicking style and, and, and it worked that way. And I really didn't realise I had a different kicking style I went down Carlton and told me. Because <laughs> I, I played off in junior football yeah. in the centre or half forward flank and I went down to Carlton and I said, oh, get in the back line. <laughs> so, you know, from that point of view, it just changed my whole game, my whole outlook in the game as well. So even though Jack Rout mentioned that to you, was, was John Nichols a stickler for, you know, skills? Now, Ron Barassi obviously was oh, a stickler yeah. for skills and handballing and doing everything correctly. Yep. Was, was John Nichols along that line or was he quite happy to live with uh, what might be perceived to be a weakness and, and work on other strengths? Yeah, I think... Um the fact was, I realised it wasn't a, wasn't a weakness in the end. It was because it looked poor. It was a visual weakness. A visual yeah. weakness. Yeah. But no, look, Carlton seems uh, through that area were very strong, highly skilled sides, and that's why they worked on just the use of the ball, the running, mm. running play, the hands, and uh, you know, kicking the position was very important. With the back line, cool. You know, you, you selfie, dual, dead English in the back pocket yeah. as well, and yourself. Your, your back line was so tight and so strong. Yeah, it was uh, a great time to play there. I mean. You know, Carlton had a, a very strong back line. They always used to build a back line, and I think it was an important part of the whole process that you built from the back line forward. In mm -hmm. fact, our on boards, like Kevin would know and Tony and yourself know, our on boards wouldn't come in the back line. They'd sit down the wing, we'd have yeah. three wingers yeah. or four yeah. wingers yeah. lining up, taking in turns, and uh, we used to get pretty annoyed at not coming down the back line. They said, well, why should we? You know, it'll come in eventually. So, <laughs> so I looked at our own devices, but no, it was a, a very important part of the Carlton days, and that's one of the reasons I think Carlton was been better this year to start to get it back on together again now. Mm. I think it's often underrated and forgotten. It was a, it was a general feeling that, uh, you know, the on-ballers at Carlton, who were very, very good, I mean, the mosquito fled yeah. at one stage, but uh, there was a feeling that the, the strength of Carlton was the, was the magnificent back line, who would then give it to the, you know, the on-ballers who had enough confidence to just sort of keep off the pace a bit, and then all of a sudden the ball would come back, and then all of a sudden the mosquito fleet would run down the ground, and that was one of the great strengths. But it really did revolve just around the strength of the back line. So if you could crack the back line, 
then of course you could find a weakness with Carlton. Yeah, that's what we used to try and tell them, but they didn't believe us. So. <laughs> <laughs> Especially at quarter time if you're five goals down. <laughs> tell us about uh, John Nichols uh, as, as a coach. Because in 1972, I mean, captain and coach, he pulled off what was, very sadly, a, a fantastic grand final win over the Tigers when a lot of people thought that Big Nick was gone and then, of course, there was Jezza and there was Robert Walls and Nichols kicking six and six and seven apiece. I mean, it was a fantastic... Uh, I mean, that was your first year at Carlton, so yep. it must have been pretty exciting. Oh, it was, and, and Nick was really important in my development because I had been sort of half-forward, ruck rover part-time and a back-pocket player, and um, he actually got me playing full-back. Uh, and actually on Peter McKenna first up as well and it was pretty daunting for me at my size to play on Peter McKenna who was a great player and uh, but he, he sort of he, he looked at players and he analysed players and he got me thinking about how players played um, he spoke well to the group but he was better one on one he'd go through and you know, explain how players played how you wanted to play the player and uh, made you think about the game and I think that was important in the preparation for the game for me particularly because I used to play on well, guys like yourself mm. and Mm -hmm. by the taller Lee players. Matthews, you could, yeah. Couldn't Lee you Matthews call your family Matthews? Yeah, you had the ability so. to do that? Play yeah. on different sized players and, and quick and tall. You played tall. Yeah, I, I mean, I was like, I had a bit of a spring. And uh, I, I, the thing that's lost in the 48, I reckon, is that the body, the use of the body. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the pushing back, I'm glad they're playing free kicks for that now. But just using your body, holding your ground and um, you know, then going for the ball. I think that's a, a lost start. And, uh, but that helped me because I could do that. And uh, recovery is very really important the way I played. I had to get the ball to the ground. Just before we get off uh, John Nichols altogether, how would Big John go in the circles today in Kevin's new rules? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, look, I mean, it's hard to compare errors because of the size and everything else, but yeah. John Nichols uh, would be a great player in any era. Mm. I think yeah. There's no doubt he was a terrific ruckman, and I happened to ruck rover a few times to him in my early days, and he'd just go there, you know, point to a spot, and I'd run there, and sure enough, you get the ball on the chest, and I know why Gags loved him, and... All the, you know, Keo and Armstrong yeah, and yeah. all those blokes loved him because he just controlled the ruck and he was just a dominant figure and, on the ground and his size and he, his football brain was just... In uh, any terrific. era, they oh. would be one of the dominant players. Oh, I, yeah, I don't think you can say one era is better than the other, but you can say that players would play, yeah. you know, good players play in any era. Well, Big Nick would take up half that little circle anyway. <laughs> 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 one of his legs. <laughs> 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 one of the big thighs. They weren't big thighs, they were massive thighs. And he had those big eyes too, steely eyes just staring down the ruckman. He was only six foot one, too, wasn't he? Six one, you know, that's amazing. Yes, but he was as wide as that couch. <laughs> but, but he couldn't, like his palming of the ball and his mm. you know, use of the ball was sensational. Yeah. And, and he brought players into the game and he, he threw his body around and used to roll on players and, and squash them and things like that's that. That's right. So. Peter Hudson is, is uh, generally, it's arguable who's the greatest full forward that's ever played, whether it's been John Coleman or Coventry or whether it's a Wade or an Ablett or, or like someone like Bob Peter Pratt. Or Bob Pratt, Love Bobby's uh, hero. Uh, Kelvin Timberton was a Kelvin, great full yeah. forward. Yeah. Yeah. But Peter Hudson, uh, you know, Most was cool. a goal kicking machine, 150 in one season mm. along with Bob Pratt. I think only two players in the history of AFL ever were able to hold in goalless during an AFL game. One was, was Barry, one? one was Barry Richardson and the other was Curly Austin. Tell us about that day when you held the great man goalless. Yeah, I think it's also always a bit of luck in, in the way you play. No, and, it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, 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 just tell him on the day. Yeah. Just, just tell us no, the well, plain facts. I think we won fairly well and uh, we, you know, at times it was tight, but the ball wasn't coming down so well because Hawthorne were very skilled as well. Mm. And uh, I think Peter had a couple of chances to kick goals and uh, he, he didn't quite take them. So I think uh, from that point of view, I'd take the, uh, the win on the day. But we won the game. It was important. But, yeah, well, look, it was nice. Looking back, it was nice to sort of Which, which ground was it at, Rod? Yeah. Which ground? At Princess Park, as it was called. Oh, then, Princess Park. Home, oh, yeah. So, yeah. He played the whole game, Kildy? The whole yeah, game? the whole game, yeah. Mm. I played on Peter a few times. Yeah. I mean, just uh, over, over the years. And, uh, What's the most he kicked on you? Oh, I think he kicked three or four one day and kicked you know, two once and, yeah, and, the, and that game. Good so record. so you had the wood on him? Sorry? Yeah. You had the wood yeah. on him. Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so old man. Oh, yeah, Paul. On grumpy, you can say you've got the wood on people like uh, Peter <laughs> Hudson. <laughs> and you're talking about body use. Was he the best? Because they just said the way he got people under the ball mm. and turned his backside in on oh, and huge. ran back an open goal. That... He had a huge backside. <laughs> 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 I was trying to reach out the punch and I couldn't reach because his backside was back so far. But, but he used to, I, I think a lot of times, he used to let you go up the ground and get behind you. Mm. And he'd always run to open goals. And mine was to sort of keep him just slightly in front of me and just come from the side, so he couldn't use his backside as much, but he yeah, was good use of the body and mm. very smart, and, and they did kick it to spots over the top so he could just turn players and get back to it, and he was deceptively quick for his size. Because he was a great goal-kicking machine and everyone expected him to kick at least, I think he averaged nearly uh, five and a half goals per game. As that game went on, 
and at half time he didn't have a goal and at three quarter time he didn't have a goal. Was there a general <laughs> feeling amongst the side that day or even yourself that, yeah. you know, maybe look at the clock, you know, he still hasn't got a goal, I can get through the game? Yeah. Curly said to the coach, can I go, <laughs> go off? off. Yeah. <laughs> I've done my <me> job. <laughs> oh, I don't think that the rest of the players really knew you know, too much what's going on because you're concentrating on yeah. your job. I don't think full back, full forward duels are sort of prominent and on balls, mines, or uh, you know, <laughs> up there than the ground. But oh, I had a fair idea at the end that you know, like he hadn't kicked any. And um, I know just after half time, he, had, he was only about 30 minutes out, and he did miss one. And as it got towards the end of the game, I kept on thinking, oh shit, don't come down here, <laughs> don't come down here, <laughs> <laughs> keep it away from me. I'm going all right here. So it yeah. looks like Backman are different than midfielders because Dougie and I used to count our stats. <laughs> we just knew well, how many kicks we had at every time, didn't we, mate? Oh, I used to get a few more than me. Probably, so. <laughs> you mentioned before about Bruce Stool also coming from uh, Jakarta, Broadmeadows mm. way. I was on radio just recently and uh, people were ringing up saying they're the greatest ever player they've seen at their club. And the number of Carlton people who rang up and said that Bruce Duell was the greatest Carlton player ever. Now you played at Carlton for a long, long time with all those great players. Ooh. How do you rate Duell? Oh, he was the most consistent player I think I ever saw and I played there for 14, 15 years and uh, Duell didn't make mistakes. He was, no, his bad game was a good game for everyone else. Like he, his, his standard was so high. I mean we had a lot of great players like Jezza and uh, you know, Southby, Mackay, Keogh, Hunter. He was the best, Hunter. Cool. Was he yeah. the best? I Bruce think Dill? in terms of the most consistent over a long, long career, longevity and consistency and uh, doing everything right by the team, uh, he, he was terrific. I mean, Did he ever say anything to you? I'd... He never spoke, he never spoke, no, I played on him once. Right. Shook me hand at the start and then shook me hand at the end and pulled me pants down as well. <laughs> uh, it was more sort of he nods and winks and, you know, yeah. just, yeah, well done or, you know, good or, you know. That, yeah. we, we, we often see... Oh, he was great. That's about the only time that I've ever seen him show emotion. When someone pulled his head back. Kevin Ablett. Yeah, Kevin Ablett. Yeah, Kevin Ablett. Was, yeah, was, yeah. was that just one of those odd things he that happened it. to him? Yeah. yeah, I think he just uh, obviously got upset in the night and uh, it was a cold Tuesday night as we played in those days. <laughs> yeah. <had> a <laughs> and it was probably freezing and we had to keep warm somehow. And uh, <laughs> Bruce just got uh, upset the night. So, yeah. <laughs> Did he what? You, you played in the great era. Is there something about the Carlton administration that um, they've always been seen as ruthless. I don't know if any clubs yeah. got it like Carlton, but yeah. th was that yeah. part and parcel you thought you were going to always win? You, you, during that era, you were very successful? Yeah, we were, we were confident. I mean, I think we were accused of being arrogant a lot of times, but yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't arrogance. It was just the fact that we thought we had a good side and we thought we could win games. And, um, yeah, I think from the administration down, you know, both like Bert Deacon when I first started and working through, you know, Decolo, it's they had this, I guess, belief that Carlton was a very competitive side mm. and the expectation was that you win games. Mm. Um, and it, it went through the players, but again, we had, had some great players from local and interstate. Yeah. But they did recruit very well. I want to take a break. When we come back, uh, we'll have a chat with Rod Austin because uh, 1979, they won a premiership. I know you, you played in that premiership side. You missed other premierships through injuries, but 79 was a big year because Jesuit was uh, captain and coach. And then, of course, there was a huge blow-up, one of the biggest blow-up stories ever in the history of AFL football. We'll take a break and we'll be back on Grumpy Old Men with Rod Austin. Welcome back to Grumpy Old Men. And, of course, our very special guest on the couch is Rod Curley Austin. Rod, in 1979, uh, I said before you had injuries and missed other grand finals, but a very special one for you in 1979. It was a great grand final against uh, the Pies. Sorry about that, yeah, Tony. Again. And, of course, uh, Alex <laughs> Jeselenko was <laughs> yes. the captain and coach. Yes, Alex was uh, a very strong disciplinarian. I mean, he'd gone from being a player and a friend to captain and coach in the previous year. And uh, I think that year we lost four games. and It was really um, coach coaching by fear. <laughs> in terms of our training. The re regime of training was very, very hard. Excuse me one minute. Jezza always gave the opinion that he was a sort of individualist as a footballer. Was he, uh, when he became coach, he just got a new set of rules or what happened? Uh, or did he, he play he, by those rules himself? No, he made the transformation from a uh, friend and, uh, and uh, I guess, teammate, uh, teammate yeah. to coach fairly quickly. I mean, he still had to have a drink with us and everything else, but when it came to training and playing, it was... Uh, straight down the line and you know the old 10 800s yeah. yeah 10 400s one on one contesting and indian file that mm. was did that he was train a... hard as a player uh not when he was coach <laughs> <laughs> no 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 before he became coach was he a hard trainer he was a playing coach oh so um oh alex was yeah he didn't probably have to uh exert himself as much yeah, he, was, right. he was a natural athlete mm. in the yeah. way he ran everything else but i think no he didn't train as hard as the other players and when he was coach it was more he was holding his, the stopwatch mm. and counting the seconds <laughs> off for us so it's interesting you talk about the fear factor because other yeah. Carlton players who played with you suggest nearly the same thing that uh, you know the training was so hard that players would be you know literally vomiting on on the side of uh, of the playing arena at training. Uh, was was that really the case that he ran the players till they were sick? 
it was more a case it was a, a large quantity of work, yeah, and worked very hard, and uh, players were often ill. Uh, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, so... But again, it pulled back discipline into the mm. club because we've been a good side for a number mm. of years without really having success from, I think, 72 to 79. We missed in 76, we thought was a good team, but... Um, we were, were you really fearful to go to training? Oh, no, I love training, but it was just... Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, you go there and say, oh, no, no Tuesday it was, night. It was more, it was more <laughs> Quite if, we got, if we got beaten. I mean, Ale oh, Alex right. is... Um, yeah. you know, Half-time, we'd, we'd go in and uh, we were probably a couple of goals down or close, and we had these great third quarters. And everyone must have thought, oh, Alex has this, uh, must be a greater raider, must have great you know, um, tactics and everything else. And he, he always said, well, simply, you know what's going to happen on Tuesday night? <laughs> 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 well, it was a fair motivation. To, to, no, he was to a go. man of a few words. Even when we saw him on World yeah. of Sport, he would sit there and they'd ask Alex questions and he'd sit there with his moustache and he'd sort of just stare back yep. and they'd think, hmm, he's a very mm -hmm. deep thinker. So they'd, they, you know, we never got much out of Alex. No. Uh, what about as far as his oratory... As, as a coach, did he speak much to the players or was it very much, again, the silent issue? Oh, it, was, it was to the point, brief and to the point, and uh, individually the same thing. It was, uh, you know, you knew what you had to do and how to go about it. And, um, again, if you, did go, if you didn't do it, then we, uh, we paid. But that's why we lost four games that year. I think you won the premiership. Mm. Kirk, what happened to you in 81, 82? KB said you missed the two grand finals back-to-back. -back. What happened to you? Yeah. I, I wasn't aware that you missed those two. Yeah, just um, 81, I had um, one of the first osteoarthritis pubis Injuries, just the uh, groin, mm. and uh, I, I literally, I, I actually felt it go against in one game. Felt the, uh, the tear, and uh, I didn't play after round 12. And the next year, I was sort of nursed through um, 82. I'd play a few games. I think I started about round yeah. three or four at Collingwood. Mm. Played a few games, had a break, and uh, got all the way through the preliminary final against Hawthorne and played well that day. And next morning at soccer at training, Parker said, "Well, just go and stand there. We've got th got you through the year. Yep. You'll be right. Go and stand in the goals." And um, so I went and stood in the goal so I couldn't get hurt and the ball was coming towards me, just rolling towards me. I went to pick it up and um, another player ran at me and uh, he actually made contact with his knee right in my thigh and it just corked it straight away and started bleeding and uh, within 10 minutes I couldn't bend my leg. So oh. Sunday morning training playing Mr. soccer. Grand final. Oh. Mr Grand Final. So yeah, on, on Monday uh, I, I tried to run around Princess Park and but the leg had sort of congealed up and I actually ruptured the thigh and had to go in hospital on the oh. Wednesday and it turned black and I was actually named on the side. I mean it was it was... Unbelievable. I was named on the side. Wasn't it training from Tuesday through to Friday or Saturday? I was in hospital sure. in a bed, bed by myself and I was picked on the side and it was, oh, yeah, he's playing, it's fine. And Because I used to miss a bit of training anyway. Mm. <laughs> and unfortunately for me, but you know, I missed out, but um, Mario Baldotto played in two premierships. Yeah. Mm. Jeff Selfie missed both years too, by the way. So mm. out of our back line, Jeff and I both missed. And, uh, other well, players had opportunities. Just so. shows they didn't have spies in those days that went and watched training. Was that right? Well, three well, days. They're asking questions and saying, uh, you know, he doesn't where train is anyway. Oh, well, <laughs> it's only grand final. We can only train. So, <laughs> comes yeah, a, lot of, a lot of people may forget. Yeah. I'm not quite certain whether you can recall, Doug, uh, but Rod actually coached Victoria. Yes, uh, that's right. For a couple yeah. of seasons, Fitzroy, when uh, yeah. there was uh, yeah. Kevin Sheedy had coached at one stage yep. when he was the coach of the Bombers, and they, he was sort of there for two or three years, and then they sort of changed it around a little bit. Then you came in as a, an employee of the AFL at the same yeah. time because you'd been coaching Fitzroy. And coach Victoria, which uh, I think uh, was undefeated. Uh, no, we did lose. You lost. Not on the Melbourne cricket ground. Now tell us about this 9495. What are you saying here? Um, Win. What's <laughs> 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 sure this This is this. Uh, oh, it's more. Actually, that's one of the best memories I've got out of footy as well. Besides all the uh, uh, the, the Carlton stuff, was the uh, that that year when Teddy Whitten did the uh, lap of the oval. Yeah, we yes. didn't actually see that, but. We were inside, but before that, Ted came in the rooms and spoke to the players individually. They went up individually and spoke to them. It was very emotional, and um, it was a, a great thing to be involved in. I think you, know, you look at premierships and other things, but in terms of uh, emotion and um, being in a situation which was, I guess, unique, that was just a, a pleasure to be involved in those, those years and those days and uh, with the Victorian side. There was a great vision of you there with uh, the marvellous Gary Ablett Sr. Yes. What, did, did you tell him what to do? Right, or did you just say, <laughs> keep out there and if the ball comes, get it? No, I just said to him, him and Tony, I could go down full forward and just, uh, when, when it comes down, just <laughs> kick it long. It. One can lead, kick I don't care who leads, you're going to get it. Lead. <laughs> kick it long. We've got two blokes here who can play, let's uh, give them a chance. Yeah. So. Well, it, was, it was a great period to be coach of Victoria because there's so many great players. I mean, we don't yeah. have state of origin now. Yeah, it was, and I think, look, talking to a few of the players now, I saw Stewie Lowe the other day, and uh, just the memories of those games, and these guys all played, and... I think State of Origin at the time was a terrific experience mm. for everyone. Um, unfortunately, in a lot of ways, the national competition's taken over and I guess uh, watered it down a bit. But in those days, State of Origin was up there with premierships and finals and, uh, mm. and I think the thrill to play in those games was just what 
players aspired to. And, uh, you know, I think looking back, Tony and Doug particularly would be saying that it was worthwhile. Well, you're now, Kurt. What are you, you're at the AFL. Yeah, in what, the what's AFL. What's your role down at the AFL? I'm in the football operations area, which is sort of the... What's that? What are you going to do? Uh, rules, regulations, uh, the draft and trade period particularly. A yeah. uh, bit of the, tri the review things, the tribunal. Um, not Kevin's Ruck rule, it's... <laughs> Kevin <laughs> Rules. Oh, Kevin Rules. <laughs> Don't go crooked move and change the rules. This man is the powerhouse, he says, yeah, down yes. at the AFL. He's the man who actually keeps the whole thing running beautifully. Oh. Rod, it's been great to catch up uh, on Grumpy on Men, one of the greats of the Carlton Football Club, and these days a big say, of course, in the running of AFL football. We'll catch you next week on Grumpy Old Men when we'll look back to the good old days of AFL football when we'll have two more stars who will absolutely delight you with all their stories and revelry and revelry right throughout uh, Grumpy Old Men.